During its early years, the Walt Disney Company had established itself as the studio for making animated films. There was a talent for converting classic fairy tale stories from the books to film that caught everyone's attention. Despite the massive success, though, even the Mouse House wavered later on in its years. While this film apparently opened successfully when released, it was not as financially beneficial in the long run. At the time, it was the most costly animated film to date for the studio, one of which would lead to a change in direction of the company for a while thereafter. So was it the film that didn't work, or just the accrued cost involved? More than likely the latter, but when looking at this film now, it's a classic yet not exactly as unique as one might think or remember. Headed by supervising director Clyde Geronimi, a slew of other sequence directors, and with a story adapted by Erdman Penner, who both did Peter Pan from 1953, the story is about a princess named Aurora, who is betrothed to wed the prince of another kingdom, and bring the two lands together. The plight of this story is when the sorceress Maleficent enters the picture. After not being invited to the kingdom ceremony, she bestows a curse on Princess Aurora that she will prick her finger on a spindle and fall into a deep sleep during her 16th birthday. From there, it's up to Aurora's fairy godmothers, quote-unquote, Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather to keep her from making this curse come true. The concept sounds different. Honestly, it really isn't by a lot. Not to mention, it has been recorded that Disney didn't want audiences drawing parallels to that of their first film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. With that said, it seems like they already knew this might be a gamble, and it sort of shows. Some people remember this film fondly for being a part of the classic Disney princess lineup. However, it seems this film is remembered more for the opposite reason. The cast of actors playing the main roles feel only what can be described as the last of the golden age of Hollywood voices. Actors like Bill Thompson, Barbara Jo Allen, Barbara Luddy, Verna Felton, and Mary Costa all participated in other movies that most would consider long before their time to know. The voice acting itself is fine for the roles the cast play, but what people tend to recall the most about this feature was Maleficent played by Eleanor Audley. Not sure if it's the stark gothic design of the character against the rest of the background, but the character has only grown in popularity since. However, the antagonist is not enough to carry this picture. The main characters themselves feel very hollow, while the character designs are friendly looking, they don't add much to the story when it comes to development. Princess Aurora, who is more of a plot device than an actual character, is pretty, yes, but she says very little of importance, and the same could be said for her betrothed partner, Prince Philip. The real main focus goes to the three fairies who work to keep Aurora secretly hidden from Maleficent. That's fine, but the title of this film isn't The Three Fairies, it's Sleeping Beauty. It also really doesn't help that this film shares similar plot elements to that of Snow White. A female antagonist places a curse on a young, more beautiful princess that puts them into a deep sleep. And love's first kiss is what needs to break the curse? I can't imagine why this story felt familiar. Yet with the runtime not even at an hour and a half, the pacing feels slower than usual, too. Perhaps it's because there are few characters who leave a lasting impression. The animation, though, cannot be discredited. Several other Disney films before it were not featured in widescreen format. But this is one of them, and it definitely adds scope to the fairy tale. Not only is the animation fluid, but well drawn with lots of detail. Imagine the effort it took to animate every cell of this picture. What a painstaking process. No digital computers to help. Lastly, the music composed by Disney familiar George Bruns did a decent job. While there aren't very many songs that will stick in the viewer's head like other Disney classic songs, the sound is still very much reflective of the scenes that play out in the movie. It may be considered a part of the Disney classics, but it's not as entertaining as one might think. The villain is surely the most memorable component, along with its animation coming in second. But it's the underdeveloped main characters, pacing, and similar plot elements that make this fairy tale a snoozer.